In Romans 10, 9, you don't have to go there. It says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, then you will be saved. The question is, do you really believe it? Because the promise is, you will be saved. Are we going to argue with that? Are we going to take that particular passage and argue against it? That's what the scriptures say. Very plain. It's also in Psalm 125, verse 1. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. What is Zion? Well, Zion is a place where all the whosoevers exist and have their place. It is the church of God. Historically, it was a part of Jerusalem. It was surrounded on all sides except the north by deep valleys. It was protected. It was separated from Mount Moriah, and it surpasses the height of about 105 feet. It was at the southeastern hill of Jerusalem. And you can hear about Zion all throughout the Psalms and Scriptures. But in Hebrews 12, 22, you don't have to turn there. It says, but you have come to Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, messengers, gospel preachers. Zion is a picture of the church. Call on him. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Not be ashamed. Now what does this mean, to not be ashamed? Not be ashamed. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Wherefore, I want to talk about this calling. The rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Another great and precious promise. Now remember the text here is saying that whosoever believeth shall not be ashamed. And we're seeing in the scriptures here that there's no difference between Jew and Greek, but it's about those who are calling upon him. Now, if this particular passage is saying to make your calling and election sure, how are you going to do that? What are some of the ways that we do that? Anybody got an answer for that? We're in the classrooms, theological uh, men's study, so we can answer. What's a way that we can make our calling and election sure? Well, I'll give you the answer then. By calling on him. <laughs> By calling on him. If we're to make our calling, if God is calling us and he calls us through the gospel, and we've just been reading, believe on the Lord, believe on the Lord, trust in the Lord, all these uh, commands, imperatives to trust him, we should be calling upon him. And that's what generally happens with the believer. They will call upon him because they're being called. It works both ways. How am I going to make my calling and election sure? Well, I'm going to call upon the name of the Lord. There's no shame. Where it says here, believe on him. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now, I wanted to go to uh, subpoint C in the first point here. No shame, we are glory bound. Turn with me to 1 John 2.28. 1 John 2.28. When we are calling upon him as a means to make our calling and election sure, when we are seeking him in the scriptures, when we are giving prayer, where we are fellowshipping around his word, we're seeking him. We want his blessing. And we just read that he will bless you. 
He will show you that you can trust him. There's no shame in that. So when we, we know that the Lord is coming again. He's coming again, a second time. And when he shows up, will you be ashamed? You know, you've got to tell your kids, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, beholding the good and the evil. He's in your mind and he's in your heart. There's nothing you can hide from him. There are certain things that are shameful that the Lord knows about. We are to confess our sins, and he, is to, he promises that he will forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we have this continual confessing. But it's a sobering question, don't you think, to ask whether or not you'll be ashamed at his appearing? Well, in John, because we're glory-bound. That's the point. We're going to glory. And now, little children, abide in him. Locational salvation. You're abiding in him. He's abiding in you. There is a union between the believer and Christ that when he shall appear, we may have confidence. Do you want confidence? Call upon the name of the Lord and not be ashamed before him at his coming. I don't want to be ashamed. I don't want to be found naked. I don't want to be found clothed in my own righteousness. I want to be found clothed in a righteousness which comes from God himself, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in him, there is no shame. There is no shame in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're glory bound. He's coming again. And when we stand before him, and we're doing these things, confessing our sins a lot, There should be no shame. No shame. Calling upon the name of the Lord, knowing that he's the Lord, our righteousness. Turn with me to Matthew 10, and we'll look at verses 32 through 33. There's no shame when he shall return, but then we must question, are we ashamed to confess him before men because it says here it is the whosoever therefore shall confess me before men him will I confess also before my father why does the whosoever confess the Lord Jesus Christ before men because like Paul said for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that will believe to the Jew first and also to the Greek or the Gentile. Not being ashamed. And we see that the promise that whosoever believeth on him, that is Christ, shall not be ashamed. But it's just a sobering question to contemplate. Are we ashamed? Are we ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we ashamed of his name? But whosoever, another type of person, shall deny me before men, Him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Now, men and women throughout all of history have taken this particular passage, and they held dear to it, because they were put in between life and being forgiven by Caesar, or by some evil, wicked ruler to deny the Lord, whether it was some Catholic cultish leader that if you didn't, abide by their dogma and you actually held to the scriptures alone Christ alone you would be burned at the stake and they would tell you to deny your faith and they knew by this particular passage they wouldn't deny the name of the Lord Jesus Christ before him because they feared holy fear that they would be denied before the Father. Is it possible for us to deny the Lord? Of course it is. We know that Peter did it, but what did Peter have to go through when he denied the Lord? Three times did he deny him. It was a lot of pain, a lot of shame, and he had to learn from that. So as believers, we have to take these examples and learn from them as well, so we don't have to be going through those situations. This is where wisdom starts to develop. 
where we just don't simply have a working knowledge, but we have an experiential knowledge that we've heard from our elders, from our leaders, such as Peter speaking to the church by his writings, you can see that he had to learn and grow through his transgressions, through his denying. He really loved the Lord, but all these things he had to experience, and he would explain them to the believers so that they wouldn't have to go through them. Like I try and tell my children, I did this. It doesn't work. It'll hurt you. Go the other way. And that's why these things are written for our learning. There's no shame. We're glory bound. We read in the text here to stay tethered to the text. He that whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now we get into this part where it talks about, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Now you can see that in my subject, we talked about believing and no respect. Now, what does it mean in, in, in point number two, no difference, no respect? I put two parentheses there. What can we put in there? That's right. No respect of persons. So right in those parentheses, we put of persons. God is no respecter of persons. That's a good thing, right? We have a very diverse church here. We have a church where there's every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. That is because God is not a respecter of persons. We can fall into that sin. But if God is that way, I desire to be like that as well. Do you? There's no difference. The most religious Jew and the most heathen Gentile, there's no difference between the two. God is the God of them both, and they must be saved the same way. And if they are elect, eternally chosen in Christ before the world began, they will be saved the same way, they're looked at the same way, and God is not partial to them. There is no difference between them, as Paul is saying. And this is where we get into Paul being an evangelical mentor. He was the Gentiles' apostle. He was going out and telling everybody, there's no difference. And if you want to talk about rel religiosity, I was cream of the crop. I was the top dog. I was a Jew, a very Jew, born out of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day, no man could accuse me of breaking any of these commandments that God had laid out in his Ten Commandments. I was blameless, he said. And now he's saying there's no difference between how self-righteous I thought I was and how heathen, idolatrous, and wicked the world might seem and those that are in it because God came into the world to save who? Sinners. And Paul would refer to himself as being before a sinner. Is that what the scripture says? No. Are you paying attention? <laughs> no, he says, I am the chief of sinners, right? I am the chief. He identified as a sinner and needed mercy just as much as anyone else in the world. And he talks about this. He is Lord over all. And you see there that word anthropos, all of mankind, humankind. Let's go to Colossians uh, chapter 3, verse 11. In Colossians 3, 11, he says, Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian. Now, when you see this word Scythian, Scythian is a nomadic, if you looked it up in Wikipedia, it's nomadic Iranian. But uh, back then, I don't know if I Iran wasn't Iran, it was still uh, considered uh, Persia. So a nomadic Persian, somebody who's just living in caves, uh, like Aborigines or Native Americans when they were, you know, living off the land nomadically and what the apostle Paul is saying here it doesn't matter how religious you are or were 
to in the Jewish faith. It doesn't matter if you were a barbarian who went around slaughtering people for gain. It doesn't matter if you're some cave dweller painting on the wall. It doesn't matter if you were a slave or if you were free. But Christ is all and in all. And what he's saying here, in this new life, there is no difference between Greeks and Jews, Gentiles and Jews. There is no difference between those who are circumcised and those who are not circumcised of people that are foreigners or those nomadic Scythians. There is no difference between slaves and free people, but Christ is in all believers and Christ is all that is important. That's the issue. Christ is the one of importance. Not what your background is. What color your skin is. Your genealogy. Where you came from. Who you're related to. The question is, is Christ that is all important to you? And if Christ is all that is important to you, then you want everyone to have Christ important to them. He's also... Lord of both rich and poor. You don't have to turn there. You probably know this verse in Proverbs 22. It says in verse 2, The rich and the poor are alike in that the Lord made them all. So whether you're rich or you're poor, bond or free, nomadic, Scythian, barbarian, uncircumcised or circumcised, religious or heathen, God is the maker of them all. God is the one who controls them, who sovereignly rules over them. And within all that category of people, God has an elect. We also know that God judges all people the same way. We read that in the book of Romans chapter 2, verse 11. For God judges all people the same way. We read in the book of James that if you've committed one trespass of God's holy law, you are guilty of the whole thing. Not only are you guilty of the whole thing, but you are a product of original sin, and you are a sinful person based upon what our parents had done, because death and sin had been passed upon us by, uh, by Adam and Eve. So we just can't say, well, I only committed a few sins. No, what we are is sin. In subpoint B, it says the Lord is rich. Now, if there's anybody who's rich that you want to know, it's God. And God gives generously. He's so rich. And this is where I started to get stuck on the scriptures. Because God is rich. We're poor. Even if you have all the money in the world, you're still poor. You don't have nothing. You can have it all. Most people who have so much money are unhappy that they don't have the things that a poor man. Better is a little, a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. Do you get that? I'd rather have a very little and have Christ than to have a whole lot of wealth which I have no right to. We were learned about the rich young ruler and that's what Christ was explaining to him better is a little a little bit with righteousness and have me take up your cross and follow me give up all you have give it to the poor follow me you want to be rich I'll show you what rich is it has nothing to do with your possessions give them away better is a little with righteousness than your great revenues without right And he walked away sorrowful. The Lord is rich. And who's he rich to? In Isaiah 45, 3, just listen. I will give you wealth that is stored away. He has stored away wealth for you. I'm talking about the wealth that is the forgiveness of sin. The wealth that is eternal life forever to be with him where joys will never end. He stored them away, and I will give you hidden riches. 
He will cause the scriptures to become illuminated to your mind and heart and soul. And you'll start to see the greater riches, which are greater than all earthly riches. When you start to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, these are hidden from the proud and arrogant, self-righteous religionists, but they are revealed to babes and sucklings, sinners like you and I, who deserve nothing. And I will give you hidden riches. I will do this so you will know that I am the Lord. And you will know how undeserving you were. And you will learn to love me. You will learn to love the Lord thy God when he gives you things that you do not deserve. Isn't this so, brethren? I will do this so you will know that I am the Lord. I, the God of Israel, call you by name. Name. Do you hear your name, Randolph? Randolph! <laughs> do I hear my own? Angelo. Do I hear your name, Mac? Do you hear your name? God says he's going to call you by name. And you're going to know it. He calls you by his sovereign, free grace. Undeserved merit based upon the merits and works of Christ alone. Undeserved favor. Sovereign, freely given. And we know... That without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This is what the Hebrew writer said. And this is what Paul is saying, that he is rich unto all that call upon him. He rewards you. He rewards you by revealing truth to you. And it's refreshing, isn't it? It isn't refreshing to know that God is rewarding you every time you show up to a Bible study and before you come, you're doing what we talked about, calling upon him. Lord, speak to me. I, you know, I'm a mess. I'm a mess. Speak to me tonight. And then he lets us know he lets us know, again, I will give you wealth that is stored away, and I will give you hidden riches. I will do this so that you will know that I am the Lord. And isn't this what historically had happened with all those people in the, in the wilderness, with Moses? I mean, he was rewarding them all the time. Isn't this what happened with the religionist? It was Christ versus religion. Show us a sign. Show us a sign. And he was raising people from the dead. He was turning uh, a few loaves into many, 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 many loaves to feed 5,000. I mean, he was just doing, he was healing withered hands. He was causing the blind to see, as we've been looking at in our Sunday school sermons. God was doing all these things. Was anyone getting it? But he does this in our lives, too. The fact that we have clothes on our back. We have transportation to get here. All these little blessings, physical blessings, those are great. But there are a lot of people who don't even have that. They're like the nomadic Scythian who's in a mud hut, but they have a preacher who comes to them and tells them about the gospel, and they hold to that as being great and precious treasure. And that is the greatest treasure, the greatest riches. He is Lord over all. And the Lord is rich to who? Who is he rich to? He is rich to his children. He is rich to those who call upon him. In the Genesis chapter 4, verse 26, Seth had Enos, and when Enos was around, they started to begin to call upon the name of the Lord. And so, in subpoint C, I simply say, call on him. Call on who? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That precious name, Jesus, which has become a byword 
amongst the nations, which has become a blasphemous word that's just come out of people's mouths all the time. And they have no idea the preciousness of just the name Joshua, a savior, a savior who is able to save to the uttermost. And you shall name his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. If you shall call upon the name, it's just saying the name. You may not know anything about the gospel or the word of God. Tonight, maybe you're here and you don't know much. But it's saying, if you shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, upon the name, you shall be saved. The name. And he shall bring forth his son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, a savior. For he shall save his people from their sins. Another thing about calling, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Seek ye the Lord. In Isaiah 55, 6, you don't have to turn there, but it says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And here you're seeing the promise that Paul gives, for whosoever shall call upon him, or the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Call on him. If you want to make your calling an election sure, call on him who is the elector. Paul is an evangelical mentor. He uses the word whosoever because he knows in all this mass of humanity that there will be those who will call. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, verse 10. See about this name, this precious name. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 11, do you have that up on the screen? That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Now, that's the name you want to call upon. The one name that every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth. Those who do not bow will bow. And those who bow now will be saved but those who bow when he comes again who have rejected his gospel shall be damned to everlasting perdition and hellfire so bow the knee surrender put your weapons of warfare away stop fighting with God you can't win bow now do not bow in a way when your heart is revealed for what it truly is on that last day. May God the Holy Spirit reveal your sinful corruption, convict you of your sin, show you a righteousness that is the righteousness we need to be accepted with God the Father, and a judgment that took place on the cross. We call upon the Lord, the Lord. Psalm 96, verse 6, it talks about the Lord. Psalm 96, verse 6, turn there with me. The Psalms are... Uh, just precious when it comes to talking about the Lord. Honor 
and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Oh, worship the Lord in his beauty and holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. And isn't this what Paul's doing? He's the Lord of the heathen. He's the Lord of the Jews. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. That is the Lord. Isaiah 45, verse 23. Who is the Lord? Let's look there. Isaiah 45. I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and it shall not return that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come. And all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. Isn't this, isn't this what Paul was writing when we see this in the book of Romans? It all makes correlation back to that Roman text. And the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. Now the seed of Israel is every blood-bought child of God, the true Jew has been, who has been circumcised in the heart, not with hands, who's had a replacement. Their heart of stone has been taken out. They've been given a heart of flesh. They actually feel. They feel their sin. They feel their inadequacy. They've been given a new heart. And these people that shall call on the Lord are those who are drawn to call. So we see evangelically we call out whosoever, whosoever. And I'm a whosoeverist. Don't put me in no Calvinist camp. I'm a whosoeverist because I call out whosoever shall believe on the Lord shall be saved. But we know that in John six thirty seven through 44, we can listen to this. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that seeth the Son, so they're being drawn, they're being given sight, and believe on him, believe on the Lord, and thou shalt be saved, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And what did the Jews do? They murmured at him, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph? Oh, he's just an ordinary man whose father and mother we know. How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? And Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. And here he says in verse 44, That no man can come to me, no man will call upon me, no man will seek me, except... The Father which hath sent me, draw him. So, there is one who preaches the gospel that is not a true gospel that says that you, within yourself, have the ability to come to God, open up your heart, and receive him. 
Nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible says that he takes out our stony heart and he puts in a heart of flesh. To as many as received him, to them gave he the right or the power to become the sons of God. But these were born not of the will of men, nor of blood, but of the will of God. So it is God that is in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. And when you are coming, it is because the Father which has sent Christ is drawing you to Christ. It is all a work of grace. And we humbly, humbly accept that by his grace, understanding that we have no power within in ourselves. Or why should we sing Amazing Grace? It's all of grace. But on the flip side, that doesn't mean that we do not call men and women to repentance and to come to Christ, because Paul's doing it here in the book of Romans. Whosoever, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And what this does is it catapults us into verse 14. of our text in Romans. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they going to believe on somebody they've not heard of? And how are they going to believe in him whom they've not have heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, we who know the truth and have been made alive in Christ are to do what Paul is doing here by calling those whom we come across, whether in the workplace, in life, wherever we may be, we are mandated to preach the gospel. Now, I'm not talking about being in the pulpit so much all the time, although that is necessary, but we as Christians have a mandate to call out whosoever will believe, knowing that there are an elect chosen in Christ before the foundations of the world, and that if it is one of God's sheep, what does Christ say? My sheep hear my voice, another will they not hear. So we go out, and we are evangelical that way, calling upon men and women to believe the gospel. Believe on the Lord, and thou shalt be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. His very name is Savior. When you call upon God, you're calling upon a Savior. You're calling upon a rescuer. You're calling upon somebody who can reach down and give you something that you cannot give yourself, which is eternal life. You're calling upon the one who brought you out of your mother's womb, gave you life, physical life and is the one that can give you spiritual life and isn't it true that we should be preaching the gospel to every man woman and child isn't that the mandate go out into all the world preaching and teaching until the last day because the last day will not come until that last elect is saved and how shall they preach Okay, before you even became a preacher, a teacher. And every believer is a preacher in some way or another. Whether it's a simple message, a complex, hermeneutical grid of interpretation, whatever it is. How shall they do those things, preach those things, except they be sent? As, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace that good news of the person and work of Christ and bring glad tidings of good things. And that's what I want to encourage you guys to do. So in this lesson, we've learned that the scripture says, whosoever believeth, they won't be ashamed. 
we've learned that there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile or the Greek because God is not a respecter of persons. We know that the Lord is lo he's Lord over all and he's rich unto all them that call upon him. The most wealthiest God who just freely gives. He's rich. Not like a Bill Gates rich. For whosoever. And this is how he's rich. How is he rich? That whosoever shall call upon the name, just the name, the name Jesus Christ, shall be saved. And that's a great promise. And I take great joy in it. Because if he comes and you're not saved, that's your fault. That's on you. Because there's so many... He came for his own, and his own received him not. But as to as many as received him, there's those who reject him and those who receive him. One who tried to merit God's favor by works and those who are freely chosen, sovereignly, who want to do whatever they do out of love, which is because they have faith, which is rooted in that love. And they're not doing things to merit. It's out of gratitude for somebody who saved them undeservingly so. And that is the message. Amen. All right, we can uh, take some questions if you like. I, I'm not sure how you enjoyed that, but the Lord blessed me with it. Are we going to do a Phil Donahoe or something? Or Donahue or something? Can you help us out, brother? Yeah, I'm glad I was here tonight because I've heard make your call in an election sure. Make your call in an election sure. But tonight, you made it very plain. And I like that, the way you took the word call. God called me, so I call upon him. So that's, in other words, it's a simple way of making my calling an election sure. Making it sure before my, for myself first and to others. And to God, making my calling an election sure. I've heard that many times, but, and then I would sit there and say, well, how do I make my calling an election sure? But by me being here tonight, it, it was made plain to me. And so I thank God for that. Yeah, you know, when he comes on the last day and he says, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. How much more should we, the believer, be calling upon him, telling him everything? Because he already knows it. But I don't want to stand there saying, well, I never told him about myself. <laughs> Think about that one. Uh, yeah, I wanted to say uh, that uh, uh, there was a great chasm of darkness uh, between the way I thought before I was a converted believer and the way that I think now. So there's no way that I could have possibly, of my all power, crossed that great gulf without God. It's, it's just no way. With men it's impossible. With God, all things are possible, brother. Yeah, when you asked the question, I think I was a little half asleep here, but now that I'm awake, how do you make your calling lecture like sure? And what came to mind was Matthew 7, verse, starting at verse 7, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find, knock and it shall, and it shall be opened unto you. For 
everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. So those three things, ask, seek, and knock, are a good example of how you make a calling in a lecture sure. Absolutely. And asking is calling. Seeking is a good thing because we saw in the scriptures that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And I believe it. When the scriptures say there's none that seek, there's none that understand, there's none righteous. If you're doing things that are contrary to those things, then that is a good indicator that life has been given and God is drawing you. Anybody else? One of, uh, it seems to be one of, uh, at least one of my, I'll speak for myself, one of my great problems has been, and I thank God for lessons like this and being here to help me to grow in this, that we can get, again, let me go back to I, can get confused between God's will and my will. And by that I'm referring to this, the, the idea of our and my willingness to place upon God all responsibility and none to myself. That is, what I hear sometimes is my and others speaking in a very hyper-Calvinistic form. That is, that God does everything and we do nothing. Yet, as pastors pointed out relative to uh, uh, Jude chapter 20, and uh, as you were just remarking and, and looking at uh, the scriptures here, is that we are to do something. Of course, that doing and the will to do it is of God. Yet, we do something. It's a very interesting paradox. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a very interesting paradox. Unless he gives you a place in, it, in you to do it, you won't do it. You won't call. You have no desire to call. He has to draw you into this relationship with him, which you willingly, by his gift, enjoy and grow in. And your constant affirmation of what he has done and does for us, that is the calling and election. That's the surety. My surety is in what he's done. So what I'm doing in making my calling and election sure is to trust in that which he's done for me and that alone. I can't fail that way because he's not going to fail. Mm -hmm. So it seems like a paradox turns out to be for me the gift of grace that allows me to be able to relax and not try to measure the amount of my faith, but rather to look to him who has provided everything that I need, irregardless of my weakness are my strength in it compared to myself at another time or somebody else tomorrow. Amen. I mean, we read in Jeremiah 17, 7, but the person that trusts in the Lord will be blessed. Well, that's a guaranteed promise. And then he says the Lord will show him that he can be trusted. Trust comes from God. Faith comes from God. The will to do anything comes from Him. But there is this thing called man's responsibility. 
and it becomes somewhat of a charley horse between our two ears. Yeah. <laughs> and we can't really figure it out. But at the end of the day, man is responsible. What they do is they reject God's sovereign, his sovereignty. They despise it. They don't want a God who controls every aspect of life. They want something that they can control. And this has been the enemy's deceptive message since the beginning. Since the beginning. You can be just like God. Exactly. Knowing good and evil. And what does that make you? That makes you like God. Mm -hmm. So you don't need somebody who's sovereign. You know? It's been the enemy uh, tactic for generation after generation. Very rarely will you hear somebody in the pulpit say God is completely sovereign. But we see in this text in Romans that Paul, who gives, who's par excellent in his way of presenting the gospel and all that's contained in the book, in the books, even though he's sovereign, he is mandated to call on men and women. And he says, whosoever. Because in that mess of whosoever, God will do, as we read in John chapter 6, verses 33 through 44, will draw them. They will hear. They will not have a problem with God being sovereign. They're like little children. And God will humble us as like little children so that we become dependent upon God as our father. Like a little two-year-old is dependent upon uh, being fed. They can't feed themselves. They need to be fed. So that's why our Lord said, humble yourselves as little children. That's the greatest in the kingdom, this little child. We just simply trust in a heavenly father who provides all things. Consider the sparrows, they hop around, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. How much more will he feed you, give you raiment and those things which are needful for the body? But we want to worry, we want to be concerned, we want to stress out, we want to try and do things ourselves, it's in our carnal nature, even as believers. But we're reminded again and again and again that he's going to take care of all those things. What we're called to do is to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the other things shall be added unto you. But there is the paradox. And I love, and I always talk about it when Paul said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Yes. So we have a paradox within our members. And it's constant. But to the unbelieving sinner who is dead in his sins and trespasses, we want them to be quickened. We want to tell them what Paul said, and you hath he quickened, who were dead in sins and trespasses. You did all those things and had no regard to God. But now that he's come and given you life, now you, now you feel some things. Mm. Now you understand. Mm, yes. Now you're in a warfare. Mm. You're, you've been made alive. Mm -hmm. Now we wrestle not against flesh and blood, mm -hmm. but against spiritual wickedness in high places, along with our flesh. So it's, it's a paradox, for sure. Brother Eric? As we've been meditating on whosoever and our responsibility to preach the gospel and share the gospel and God's sovereignty of having a people for himself um, and all that, uh, just thinking about that one verse in 2 Timothy chapter 2 where it kind of brings it all together. Uh, Paul says, uh, therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake. Mm -hmm. So here's this. He has endured all things. Man's responsibility 
going out, preaching the gospel, but knowing that it's the whosoever, that whosoever is the elect. All right? Mm -hmm. So it's, I'm just, uh, as you were preaching, I'm just thinking about that verse right there, where it's like, here is uh, our responsibility to share the gospel, to preach the gospel, knowing that uh, it's for whosoever and that whosoever uh, is the elect. Right, and when you think about the church, Christ is the head of the church. We are the body. He's also the, considered the cornerstone of this foundation of this building that's being built. You want that to be built. You also want that body to be complete. And so like Paul, I endure all things for the elect's sake because out of this mess of humanity is that building and is that body. So when you're preaching, you're preaching to bring that body together, which is precious in the sight of God. And that which is precious to God was precious to Paul. And so I think it's important that we keep considering these things so that in our prayers and our calling upon God, we would ask him, Lord, make these things precious to me. Because man has an issue with a limited atonement. That it's limited to those who are part of this church or part of this body but yet we still call out those who have problems with those things we tell them hey just bow down you know stop fighting but it's just certain you know animosity towards sovereignty All right, Duke. All right, um, so back in Romans 10, 14 and 15, uh, what you ended on as far as uh, preaching the gospel, uh, as you were reading it, can we pull that up by any chance? Is that possible? 14 and 15, Romans 10, 14 and 15. Um, it says, how then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now, with that, um, actually, we was talking to Ivory before, and sometimes it's easier to understand in English when you flip it and when you read it backwards. Is this one of those verses that you can read backwards in the sense of um, it's, if you read it from bottom up it says how how beautiful are the feet that bring good tidings and then um, and how shall they preach except that they be sent and how shall they hear without a preacher and how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard and how shall they call upon him him in whom they have not believed. It just made it a lot easier for me to understand it when it was flipped upside down because it was describing how beautiful the feet of the preacher that goes out and preaches to people that have not heard if you read it backwards. Otherwise, yeah, that's it. Right, and when we're looking at that text and we're talking about beautiful feet, if you were to look at my feet, you would say, man, those feet are messed up. But those are... Uh, Metaphors or analogies, more like metaphors, using the feet as being beautiful. God views the feet because what do the feet do? They actually carry this body and carry the weight to get us from point A to point B. But whether you read it that way or the way you were saying, I don't see issue with it because it's the same message. It's the message that's... Uh, being said here that yes it's it's a beautiful thing in the sight of God when a gospel preacher preaches the gospel to his people and it's a beautiful thing when he's sent right unfortunately there are many who we know and recognize are not sent because they do not preach that gospel 
Yes, yeah, some sent and some went, right? <laughs> I want to be a sent. When you go went, that's on you. That's W with the big will. Uh, you want to be sent. I like that. <laughs> some sent and some went. If God sends a preacher, he's going to look at them as having beautiful feet because he's preaching good, good things. What are those good things? All the things that we have been discussing. Because the Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. It's just true. It's undeniable. He's rich. Even when we are in disobedience. You know the word disobedience can be the same word as unbelief? In the Spanish language, when you take the word unbelief, they translate it. Every time you see unbelief in the book of Romans in the Spanish Bible, it's said this way, disobediencia. So it is disobedience to not believe. To not believe is to disobey. So we are called and commanded to believe. And if you don't, it's disobedience. You guys ready to? I just thought about something when you was talking about being disobedient. You know, Zachariah, he failed to trust God in giving, you know, the birth of his son, uh, Elizabeth, his wife, and God struck him to be he couldn't speak for nine months. And so one commentator said, it's dumb, you're a dummy, not to trust God. You're just a dummy. And so Zachariah was spoke, used to smoke in the name of dumb, where he couldn't speak. I just thought about that when you were talking. <laughs> I felt dumb quite a few times myself. And it's pretty dumb not to trust the sovereign God. Uh, and that's what we are naturally. Is everybody, uh, any more questions? I wanted to talk about, um, maybe we could turn off the internet. This doesn't need to be seen or heard. Now everyone's gonna wanna know. <laughs> You'll have to show up tomorrow. So what I wanted to discuss this, uh, is that we have what is called sign-up sheets and they're located in the bathrooms they're located in the fellowship hall and in the children's church I want to just put into your thinking I you know if God has given you a, a body that is able to labor amongst us to try and find something to do there are sign-up sheets in those places that I've told you there's things to do but I as an elder here, we've been lacking in some of those areas. Um, and I just want to put that into your thinking. We have these sign-up sheets. I had meant to get them. And what I want to start doing, and I talked to Stephen Clow about this, is to have these sign-up sheets on the Saturday men's meeting. At the end of the meeting, we can sign up for some of these things. If we all put our hand to the plow in that regard, in the menial task, It'll just make everybody's life easier. We are definitely like the children of Israel. We have to put up tent. We have to put down tent. It is laborious. Uh, I'm finding myself, just to be open and honest with you, as I am growing and maturing as an elder, uh, I am becoming more and more um, involved with people and some of the questions or some of the financial issues that we might have after church. So it's hard for me to do some of those menial tasks. So I'm asking, and we have uh, Deacon Stephen Clow and Deacon Mike Peterson, Deacon Gerald A.G., and Deacon Charlie uh, Baldwin, Charles Baldwin. Um, so if you see them, ask them. You might want to ask them what you can do if you're, you know, God has enabled you to want to do something. I'm talking about little things. I'm not talking about taking on some laborious task 
It's just the little things around here. We have Brother Eric Ruins, one of his ch uh, kids, take the trash, all these trashes, and replaces them. And it's important to do that because these bugs get in there. Even if you have just a few candy wrappers, the ants will show up and uh, it becomes a mess. So we always exchange those. Then we have the bathrooms. You know, we got a bunch of men, you know. We have 800 plus people here. And um, we need to keep that place clean. Um, one of the things that, uh, like tomorrow, we're going to have lots of food. There's a lot of cleanup after that. Uh, I thank you guys for, for being involved. All of you here I've seen put your, your hand to the plow in that regard. Um, but I'm just putting this into your thinking because some of us, we do take on, I believe, too much for ourselves and it can become rather weighty when it comes to just laboring. Laboring for the gospel is a gift. We're reminded, Paul says, if a man has the gift to serve, let him serve. So if you have that gift, utilize it, knowing that you're serving God who has served you. And so it's just a reciprocal relationship, and that's all you're doing in trying to help the body so that we're all not you know, trying to take on too much. Uh, one of the things that we see is the dishwashing. We, I bought the church a dishwashing unit so that's portable. We got two buckets so you can rinse them. Somebody fills that with water. So you have soapy water and then you take them out, scrub it down and you rinse it off into the hot water sink. Those are some of the things. But if you have one person doing that, especially tomorrow, it is a long and hard task. But if you have three people doing it, it's not hard because now you got people, you know, you're talking, you're fellowshipping, you're trying to get it done. These are just some of the things that I want to put into your thinking because as the church grows, we need to be a little more cognitive about those who are doing the work. The Bible says, mark those who labor amongst you. You watch them. They're, they're always laboring and they're, they're quiet people. But as the church grows, we just need to, you know, help out. Yes, Randolph. And just to add to that, I've been involved with the children's church and we lost a couple of our teachers. Um, you know, they, they've been volunteering for a while, so if anybody's interested in, in uh, wanting to be a teacher or a helper for the children's church, let me know so we can uh, get you on the schedule. Yeah. Uh, and is there an email or something? That they... Yeah, I can. I mean, if you, if you just see Ra see Randolph, if you're interested in wanting to teach the children, see Randolph and uh, go through the necessary process of, of of wanting to do that. That is a task. That's a very uh, tough task to be have patience with children. Yes, Mac. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, Angela, maybe you can help me. You remember, brother. You're, you're talking about Hillary? Yeah, Brother Hillary. Yeah, we still pray over there. Yeah, you still go. Yeah, he started that. Um, we got Brother Ivory, Brother Melvin Piper, myself, Duke has been coming out. Um, and that's, that's a glorious thing. I'll tell you something about Brother Hillary Chappelle. I think that's his last name. I was going through some struggles. and When you're up here leading worship, it's hard to lead worship if you have struggles. Huh? <laughs> so, this is where I take the Bible very seriously because when I was reading to you that if you trust the Lord, He will show you that He can be trusted. When you call upon Him, He's going to show you that He's rich in mercy. And I was doing that, and along came Hillary. He says, hey, Angelo, let's go pray. 
Let's go pray before, the, uh, before you go up there. It made all the difference in the world. It was an answer to prayer. And God came through with Brother Hillary. So that is a very, very special and intimate thing that if you want to be a part of, we're there just before service around 1110. And we just keep our, short, our prayers short. And we ask that the Lord would bless those who are in attendance and bless the message. And God has come through. And that's what Charles had and Spurgeon had. He had men in the boiler room praying for the message as he spoke the message. Because you want your message to be spirit-filled and anointed to bless the hearers and to save lost sinners that are God's chosen. And uh, he's blessed it. I, I, it's just, it's a miracle of God's free grace. Um, and I, that's very important to me. But when, when you go home tonight and you're thinking about these things, pray that the ministry would continue to grow up helpers for the ministry. Helpers. Because the church is... Uh, the angels don't come in here at night and clean up things. Even though my name's Angelo, they don't just show up and sweep the floors. It's done by people. It's done by people who are doing this out of love, but it can become a bit weighty. I served as a deacon for quite a few years. I love being a deacon. And uh, I still am at heart. Uh, you know, who's the greatest in the kingdom? A servant. Not the one up here preaching and doing all the teaching. It's the guy doing the labor that nobody's paying attention to. See, God does things to confound the people who think otherwise. Some of my most intimate uh, times were as a deacon doing the menial task. But uh, let's pray and we'll ask for traveling mercies and uh, thank you all for coming out. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you for this message, Lord. We pray that we would uh, call out that to whosoever shall call upon you shall be saved. And we, we ask these things in that name, that precious name, that holy name, the name of your darling Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us life and immortality, who has abolished death, for our sins. We will forever be with you in glory. What greater riches await us than just this life on earth? Lord, you are rich to all them that call upon you, and we, we thank you for it. Give us good sleep tonight. Give us traveling mercies. Bless us for your glory's sake. In Jesus' precious name, amen.